What's the word, y'all? Hey, this is the earliest recap video I have ever filmed because the Warriors are down by 47 with, with a whole quarter and a half to go. And they close out game with no John Morant. <laughs> They're down by 47. This is why this game is so great to me because it's as unpredictable as possible. I mean, I thought that the life was sucked out of Memphis after the last game where they were up or at least in it without John Morant. Jerry gets his shot blocked and Steph Curry turns up in the fourth quarter. I just assumed that even if the Memphis Grizzlies were to win this game, I just assumed that the Warriors would come and fight. It is 108 to 60 right now. Are we serious? Shout out to Jaren. Shout out to the um, uh, Memphis Grizzlies defense because they are turning these boys over like it's nobody business. Steph Curry's done for the night. There's 15 minutes of gameplay left, which is smart. I mean, why even play him when you're down by 50 almost, right? But wow, the earliest, earliest I've ever done it. It is now 110 to uh, 61. It is 110 to 61. Klay Thompson is done for the night with a minus 45 and 25 minutes. Are you serious? As of right now, listen, these numbers are just going to increase. Actually, no, I would assume that Taylor Jenkins is going to pull his starter soon now that he see that the Warriors threw the red flag in. But Jaron Jackson Jr., 21 points, 8 rebounds, 3 assists, 4 threes. Desmond Bain, 4 threes. Tyus Jones is the most premier non-turnover point guard in the history of basketball. Today, 21 points, 9 assists, and, and zero, literally 0 turnovers. They have three as a team right now while the Warriors were sitting at 18 18 of them things and it is that is as disappointing as it gets if you're a Warriors fan luckily for you if you're a Warriors fan you got two more shots to close this series out but the way these Memphis Grizzlies team this team has been playing over the last two games you can tell that they are not afraid last game was a stinker on both sides but you could tell that these boys are not afraid at the moment they play pretty solid without John ja Morant being in the lineup um during the regular season but then I think before tonight they had lost their last five games without Ja. this is a crazy Crazy, crazy momentum, but you got to go back to San Francisco and get another one, Memphis. Make it a game, man. What you did tonight is replicatable in the sense that you can force this team to turn the ball over. It's insane because their offense is so fluid and so great, and I guess that's the reason why they turn the ball over so much, but in the regular season, they were 29th in turnovers per game, only in front of the Houston Rockets who play 18-year-olds. You know what I'm saying? Um, Shout out to, to Steven Adams. You're going against a team that basically doesn't have a center or doesn't play a center. He came in and got six offensive rebounds, five offensive rebounds for Brandon Clark and, and then three for Jaron. They came out with a game plan and they succeeded. I made a joke about Coach Mike Brown because he is the interim coach because um I guess Steve Kerr is in health and safety protocol and they have not looked good um under Mike Brown in these two games. So I, I made a little jokey joke about it and um uh, Kings fans are not happy because you know jokes are typically at their expense when you when you you know hire a guy like this to be your head coach. Who knows what's gonna really happen but rough that this is taking the pre not the pressure off the pressure's on but it's taking the focus away from the Celtics you know because because 30 40 minutes ago that was the only thing that was on my mind the way this Boston Celtics team blew a game it was very reminiscent of earlier in the season remember early in the season before the Boston Celtics went on a legendary run they were blowing 20 point leads they were just collapsing under pressure today was the first time they've done that in some time and it couldn't have been at the worst time in a 2-2 series in game five it is the most important game of the series I think I Actually, let me go get those numbers because I remember reading those numbers and it's bad. From NBA.com, teams that win game five of the 2-2 best of seven series go on to win the series 82.8% of the time. So game five is about as pivotal as any other one you know what I'm saying it's as pivotal as any other one because now the Boston Celtics were just at home and they lose and now they got to go to try to win two more games one in Milwaukee and one back at home it's gonna be hard man this boy Giannis is ridiculous and, and I just saw a statistic that in closeout games in the Bucks favor and the coach bud era they are 8-0 when they have an opportunity to step on your neck they do that and they do it successfully so this was a game that you needed especially considering the circumstances you were up by I don't know how Many, actually, let me go look and see how much you were up by. With eight minutes to go in this game, the Celtics were up by 11 points, and it felt like they had it. You know, that's that's still a lot of time for sure, but it felt like they had a lot of the momentum going into that. And then a lot of things started to change. And here go my list of notes of things that changed in that eight-minute span. Um, the first thing on my list says Marcus Smart shaking my head. We're gonna get to that. Bobby Portis's rebounding came up extremely, extremely clutch. Let me see this box score. How many did he finish with? Seven offensive rebounds from Bobby Portis and none of them was bigger than the one off the Miss Giannis free throw very late in the game and that was making up for a play where he had a wide open layup and he like completely basically airballed it huge rebound from Bobby Portis he airballs his layup 
and then they get a stop, and he's running the fast break. Bobby running the fast break. He gets it on the wing, and he had an open three, but he decided to one more. And I think he won more than to Pat Connaughton, and Pat Connaughton hit a huge three, or it might have been uh, Drew Holiday. It's all rubbing together today because Drew Holiday hit some big ones. Pat Connaughton hit some big ones. Pat Connaughton got one of the quickest releases, and no matter where he catches the ball, he's shooting from it. If he catches it above his head, he's releasing it right there. If he catches it to his left, he's releasing it right there. That guy's trigger is ridiculous, and he had a big-time performance. Coach Bud decided, hey, George Hill can't play 30. 30 minutes so he only played 12 and he they, I mean he was a minus 15 in those 12 minutes but he decided <laughs> that we actually this lineup with George Hill in it is not it we gonna ride with our dudes and I mean I gotta mention Giannis because another 40 point performance 40 11 three three assists some clutch free throws down the stretch again. He missed that one, but it was it was like calculated. You feel me? He knew that Bobby was going to get that rebound. But Giannis continues to be just like the greatest in the world. <laughs> as simple as that. Let me go back to my notes. Oh, um, there's a tweet. There's a tweet that I saw on the timeline um, that kind of sums up this fourth quarter for the Boston Celtics. And it is from, it's from Keith Smith. I knew his last name was Smith, but I could not think of his first name. It's from Keith Smith. Rewatching the fourth quarter, the Celtics gave up at least four three-pointers because someone, usually Tatum, Brown, or Grant were barking at the refs and didn't get back on defense and that had been a, bu a big problem um, for the Boston Celtics this game where the other team goes on a huge run on a fast break because somebody doesn't get back Tatum had a play in this game where it ended in a Wesley Matthews three because he was talking to the refs because he didn't get a call that he thought he deserved you cannot do that in a game five, when this team is having momentum and having this comeback, whether or not you think you got fouled or not, you got to go play defense. You wait to the next day of ball if you really got something to say to the refs. But let's be honest with you. How, how much of the complaining to the refs do you think actually changes the way the refs do their thing? I think there's an argument that it matters to some extent, right? Um, Like, I've, I've definitely seen clips of Steve Kerr telling to the refs, Watch the way he doing that on Steph. And then three possessions later, the defender does exactly what Steve Kerr told the ref to watch. And then it was a foul. I know it can it can help. It can open up the eyes to the referees. But, like, if it's happening to this extent, to the, to the extent that Keith Smith said, what, what do you say, four? Four three-pointers were given up because somebody wanted to complain to the refs and not get back on defense. Insanity, bro. Insanity easily avoidable outcomes and then this is a conversation deeper than this initial game or any game at all um and, and we actually had this conversation on our podcast um about flopping flopping is a big thing in the nba it always has been you know from as long as i've been an nba fan flopping has been a thing from manu ginobili andre karolinko though like i know we remember these players fondly but they they were floppers too you know what i'm saying and it's it it goes from the best players in the league to the worst players in the league. It's a part of basketball at this point. It's ingrained in our culture as as fans or in the NBA world, and it, it needs to change. It needs to change. You know, I'm not I'm not specifically pointing the finger at Marcus Smart, but he's the perfect example right here, right now. And the play where Drew Holiday ripped him on the very last possession, the fact that this man jumped four feet in the air and threw his hands up like he got that somebody shot him. Is ridiculous. And and there was a play earlier where he flopped and, and got an offensive foul. And I guess that's gamesmanship, Kenny. Flopping in general has become a part of our game and it makes it hard, not just for the for the NBA fans to enjoy the game because of it, but it makes the game harder for the referees. We always talk about oh refing was was trash, it was terrible, bada boom, bada bam. And then you have to realize that these refs are being manipulated by the players because Marcus Smart or Giannis or Pat Connaughton, Garrison, Math Garrison Matthews, uh, Grayson Allen. I did that in my main channel video. I called Garrison Matthews, Grayson Allen, and I know the comments about to go crazy. That video is coming out tomorrow. But because they're flailing their arms and they've, they've become so very good at selling a call, that it's hard for the referees to know, was he really hit? The thing happened in game four, game four versus the Warriors and the Memphis Grizzlies, right? Steph Curry got pushed in the back late in the game and it was a foul on, I think it was Desmond Bain. Then they showed replay from a different angle and he wasn't even touched but because Steph Curry just so good at flailing his body around it was a foul and I don't mean the guys are trying to have this conversation how do you how do you fix this because it is such a big part of our game the NBA said years ago we're gonna start finding these players how many times have you legitimately seen a player get fined maybe a handful seven in the last five years since they they talked about this thing it doesn't happen often so I'm trying to figure out what do we do next and the idea that came up to mind and it's literally we did it on the podcast right and I, I, I didn't even prep for it but this was the idea that I had in mind and and you tell me because uh, I guess the audience is bigger here than with the podcast what you think of 
of this idea when it comes to flopping. Now, I will not tell anybody that once a flop happens, that we need to go look at the monitors and, and go see was it a flop or not because the game is already as long as it is when you look at these monitors. I'm not trying to add to that because it's slow. It slows down the pace. It slows down momentum. But what I will say is there could be some type of retroactive punishment, if you want to call it that, similar to them waiting to after the game to find somebody. But we start using these extreme flops, and I don't mean like just a, like some flops are more impactful or bigger than others, right? Um, and when we get to these extreme flops, these these flops that manipulate the refs in a big moment, we got to start figuring out a way. And, and the thing that I said was we start to turn them into technical fouls retroactively. Now, I don't mean that one flop means one tech because I think that just gives such a small window for these players, right? Because in my mind, um, when you get a certain amount of technical fouls, you get suspended for a game. And I think you can use that type of method when we're, when we're talking about flopping to just discourage players from doing it. Marcus Smart won't flop as many times. This player won't flop as many times if he knows that if I flop 20 times, I'm going to get suspended for a game. And my team needs me. And you know these things carry over to the playoffs. My team needs me. I don't, I don't know what it is, but that was the first thing that came to mind. And I don't say I love the idea, but that was just the first idea that I had. Anyway. Uh, let's talk about Drew Holiday because Drew Holiday has had a ton of ups and downs in this series alone because in, in some of these games, you can tell that he is trying to make up for the loss that is Chris Middleton. And it makes sense. I mean, Giannis can't do everything by itself and they don't have a ton of shot creators. They got shot makers. We talk to Pat Connaughton. We talk to Brooke Lopez. They got shot makers, but they don't have a lot of shot creators. So Drew Holiday over the series has tried to, to put that backpack on and take over some of those possessed for Chris Middleton. And in some of these games, you could tell he's trying, obviously, but he had been struggling. For the entirety of the series right now, he's shooting 34% from the field, 35% from three, and obviously that's not going to cut it, but he's averaging 22 points per game. But in this game, it, 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 it shows why Kevin Durant, it shows why some of the greatest players in the league say that Drew Holiday is the best perimeter defender in the league. Because when he is locked in, he is locked in. And I think, you know, I watched a lot of Bucks games this season, not all of the Bucks games. I thought that in the regular season that he didn't show this type of intensity as often as we're used to, which is okay. They just got off a championship. Why do I need to give my all defensively for 82 games in a season when I know I can turn it up in the playoffs? And that's what he has been doing, man. Those last two possessions are absolutely insane. The snatch block save and, and to get the ball back is ridiculous. Drew Holiday's defense. And then the very last play, no timeout for the Boston Celtics. Something happened where Marcus Smart was the only player that was looking to come to the ball. That's one thing I can say about Marcus Smart, even though he met, hey, had some bonehead uh, plays where like Bobby Portis gets the offensive rebound. Some of that is because Marcus Smart didn't box out completely or the, the Drew Holiday block. Marcus Smart is never afraid of the moment. And sometimes it's to his own detriment, as you see today. But like if you look at their postgame interviews, he says in it, some these plays were built for Jason Tatum, but something something fell apart. You know, there's some miscommunications and now nobody knows what to do. Everybody was standing around. This is literally what Marcus Smart said after this game. This was built for Jason Tatum. It didn't go through. So everybody's standing around. So somebody had to do something. So he decided it was going to be him and he said obviously if he knew that Drew Holiday was there he wasn't going off with that shot but Drew Holiday happened to be there it was like damn I was trying to think of an anime reference uh I know there's a ton there's a ton I can make but I'm struggling also it's eight minutes left in this game and the Grizzlies are still up by 50 they have 126 points and they have the bench warmers in um and the Warriors probably won't crack 90 I'll bet the I'll bet the under if if you said it's at 90 for the Warriors right now Damian Lee for three he hit it. Uh oh. Ah, I was just. I would have just lost some money. <laughs> they got. They got scored 10 po 11 points in eight minutes. They probably gonna do that. Either way, um, Drew Holiday just continues to to be the guy defensively, um, that you need. Just coming up huge in these moments, man. And if this Bucks team go on to win this series, and they go on to, because a lot of people believe, and I'm trying to figure out if I believe this as well, that this is the is the finals. I don't know. I don't know. Nobody has been super convincingly amazing so far this playoffs, and that's what making that's what making the playoffs amazing to me. Like um, the the Heat have been really good, but I can't say that they're the favorite to win. The 76 have had their moments. I can't say they're the favorite. Same thing with this matchup or the War you, Warriors down by 50 to a team without John Morant, and then Luca sometimes single handedly taking on the entire Suns team. And then sometimes then this entire Suns team is taking on Luka. And then Jaws out for the playoffs. So there's no team that's head and shoulders over the other ones. So some people look at this as the championship the championship series. That whoever wins this is going to win the conference. Go on to the championship and win. I don't know if I believe that just yet. But uh, Drew Holiday, absolutely incredible in the last six, seven minutes of this game, man. Um, and, and switching it on to Marcus Smart. Yeah, man. 
and and, and real time i was like what the what the hell marcus you know but this was this is a whole team thing this was not a marcus smart thing again he's going to get a guy be the guy to get a lot of the the hate if you want to call that a lot of the criticism because of the block shot um uh because of the missed rebound or because of the turnover that drew how they forced with zero seconds left whatever it was but i think it was way bigger than that like i said these are moments where the team in general has to has to be better might be the smallest you'll ever see me on a uh video screen but i wanted to let you see tatum on this play if we look at the play that the marcus smart block i mean he sees an opening and, and i mean i think 99 percent of hoopers see this opening and they're going at the rim um, but he didn't have the peripherals to see Drew Holiday, who sh normally would probably be attached to um, Jalen Brown here. But he just makes the executive decision to come over. Oh, my God. I didn't realize that Pat Connaughton recovered so well. Like, even right here, if Drew Holiday doesn't even contest, this is a hard basket to finish either way. But you can see, like Marcus Smart said in his postgame interview, this play was drawn up for Jason Tatum to come off this Al Horford thing. But something happened. Where it was miscommunication. I don't think they saw, I don't think Al Horford saw that the ball was inbound because he's supposed to go set that screen for Tatum and and Derek White has the ball. You see, he's looking like, is anybody gonna do anything? And now Marcus Smart, like nobody's moving. So I guess I'll do it. You know, so I can't I mean, I guess I fault Marcus Smart for taking the shot because there's still a lot of time to maybe reset and just go with plan number two. But I don't know, man. I, I just don't think these guys were super aware of their situation. Okay, I forgot about this turnover with 50 seconds left. I forgot that this one even happened. Um, Wesley Matthews. Oh, my God. I don't know how I've gone this far without mentioning the name Wesley Matthews. He played incredible defense um, down the stretch on Tatum, uh, forced Tatum to take some really tough shots. I had people on the timeline questioning Jason Tatum's shot um, quality, if that's the word I'm looking for. Um, and, and Wesley Matthews did a great job on him. But this one right here hurts more than all of them combined. Because um, find Jason Tatum on your screen, all right? There's a there's the pass here. They say the inbound players, the the oh my god, I didn't realize there was a player down. <laughs> oh my god, Wesley Matthews ends up falling here. Um, they always say the inbounder is the most dangerous player because he's got this full head of steam now in the opening, right? He's got a scene. He gets it back with Wesley Matthews falling. Like I said, he played great defense on Tatum all night. He gets his head up. That's a shot for Jay, or at least. A attempt they didn't get the shot up so that's the temp i'm sure that Giannis would have came over to cover this ground oh but maybe not now he's got to make the decision no he's going out to contest jason tatum and letting Derek white take the game time shot i'm living with Derek white taking a shot i'm contesting jason tatum but you know there it is there's the drew holiday swipe and the drew holiday seal of approval man and hey it's it's going to be extremely and i mean extremely extremely hard um, for the Boston Celtics to take this series. I'm not saying it's impossible because nothing really is, but I'm not betting against Giannis in a, in a closeout scenario. I just saw him drop 40 tonight. I've seen him drop 50 in closeouts. I know that he wants to end this series and um, he's going to try his best to do that thing. So let me know what you think about these games. Um, update to the score, 126 to, oh my God, 82. Kaminga with a huge dunk. They can't even celebrate over there on the bench because we're down by 40. <laughs> I appreciate y'all.